and welcome to the program. I am DJ Badimasi. The long hand of the law has finally caught up with former lawmaker and chairman of the House of Representatives Committee on Petroleum Subsidy, Farouk Lawan, for his involvement in one of the high-profile corruption cases in Nigeria. The four-time lawmaker has been sentenced to uh, 19 years in jail for receiving 500,000 naira bribe, $500,000, I should say, bribe, from the chairman and chief executive officer of Zenon Petroleum and Gas Limited, Femi Tedola. Now, in the case which has been in court since 2013, Lawan has been found guilty of demanding $3 million, out of which he collected $500,000 with a view uh, to removing Otedola's company's names now from the list of firms indicted by the committee for allegedly abusing the fuel subsidy regime in 2012. In her judgment, Justice Angela of the Federal High Court, Abuja, relied on the video clip tendered as evidence of extortion against the lawmaker by Otedola, which showed Lawan receiving an envelope that the prosecution said contained the bribe. Lawan was found guilty on the three-count charge brought against him by the Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offenses Commission, ICPC. He was sentenced to seven years each on counts one and two, as well as five years on count three, although the sentence now is to run concurrently for about seven years. Joining me now uh, to discuss this further is a lawyer, Tunde Falola, who joins us from Abuja. So Falola, thank you very much for joining us on the program. Um, uh, this is, th th yes, this is yet another high-profile corruption case. And uh, of course, this is a conviction uh, for conviction now secured by the ICPC. How significant is this conviction uh, in, in the country's fight against corruption? Uh, first and foremost, let me thank you once again for having me around. And uh, let me state right from the outset that even though I've not seen a copy of the judgment that convicted uh, the Honorable in question, uh, regarding the question that you just asked, uh, how significant is the conviction? Well, let me start by saying uh, we have to give it to the judiciary. I say this because uh, if you look at the history of that case, almost uh, four to five years or thereabouts, that uh, this matter has uh, started, a lot of uh, you know, shenanigans and uh, what have you, you know, came in. But eventually, the judiciary uh, was able to prove to the whole world that uh, uh, you know, it's up to, to the task, uh, given, you know, having regards to the, uh, the power given to it by the Constitution. Uh, be that as it may, I think, uh, uh, to me personally, I don't think there is anything to be celebrated about this uh, conviction, mm -hmm. uh, given the fact that, uh, you know, we have other cases where uh, all these uh, anti-corruption agencies secure conviction in the past. But at the end of the day, you know, nothing really, it, they, they, they have no uh, positive uh, or significant, uh, 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 you know, impact on the image of the country. Uh, in other words, if you look at the antecedent of most of these uh, uh, corruption cases in the eyes of the international community, we look like uh, an unserious nation. Because uh, look at the case of uh, uh, former governor of Abia State. He was convicted. Later, when the matter got to Supreme Court, the conviction was set aside. It now appears as if uh, we are a nation that celebrates uh, you know, uh, corrupt people. So it doesn't really matter whether the court this time around secured a conviction in respect of this case. Of this case. We have to look at the, uh, the fight uh, uh, by this anti-corruption uh, agency. What significance have they uh, made? You know, in, in the mind of uh, an average Nigeria, they don't see anything serious about this uh, fight against corruption. But, but well, let, that me, let, me just ask like you, said, let me ask you one question. I mean... We're talking about a man who, when he was in the National Assembly, was regarded as Mr. Integrity. I mean, Farouk Lawan, quite a high-ranking member of, yes. of the National Assembly at the time. Quite high-ranking, high highly regarded. At some point, a lot of people thought, well, someday he was going to become the, the Speaker of that House or probably occupy a, a higher position. You know, for someone like that, how, how did Mr. Farouk Lawan go from being such a high-profile individual who was regarded as Mr. Integrity to, to becoming 
uh, a, a convict now. How, how, does, how do you explain that? Thank you very much. Uh, you know, the issue of uh, corruption, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't affect a particular or category of uh, uh, people. It's cut across every facet of our national lives. Both the, you know, the, when you talk about politician, you talk about civil servants, you talk about students, and even everywhere there is corruption in Nigeria as of today. So it doesn't really matter the caliber or the, uh, the caliber of people involved in that uh, 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 matter. Honorable Farouk, by his conduct, the court has established that he actually, you know, uh, you know, attempted or indeed committed an offense by that conviction. So it doesn't really matter whether you, he was uh, you know, an ex-National Assembly member. Anybody can involve in the commission of an offense. And what is important is for him to be subjected to rigors of a trial, which has happened, which has taken place in this case. So to me, I don't see any special things, any big deal about uh, an ex-member of National Assembly being convicted. Once you are corrupt, once you are caught by the law, you face the rigor of the trial. And that is exactly what has happened here. So his conviction has nothing to do with his uh, status. He has committed an offense. He was charged to court. And he was convicted. It could happen to anybody who's also who has that uh, corrupt uh, you know, tendency. It's, so to me, it's, it's, it's uh, just, that it's uh, just question quite, does not arise yes, at all. Yes, I, I understand your point. It's, it's just quite surprising that for an individual who was considered Mr. Integrity, whose integrity was almost sky high back then, uh, and that's the reason why he was even appointed the chair to, to chair that committee to investigate uh, uh, corruption. For, for such an individual investigating corruption to become immersed in corruption himself, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's, it's shocking. But let's talk about um, the length of time it took to get, um, well, to, to get this uh, judgment. Uh, you, you must agree that it, it took quite a long time. Why, why would a case like this drag on in court for so long? Why, for instance, uh, w would it be difficult to say, you know, try this case and, and get, uh, get a conclusion in about six months to one year? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, the issue of, uh, you know, the case being delayed or dragged for so many years, you know, borders on the kind of a society we find ourselves, the kind of a legal system we have. Uh, this is a society where everybody, particularly the rich, the politicians, they want to exploit, you know, every available opportunity, you know, to pervert the, you know, the course of justice. What do I mean? What I mean is that, you know, without prejudice to the entire, you know, to the parties involved in that case, even though I wasn't part of the, the, of the, of the case, there are other factors you have to, you know, consider when you are talking about delay, you know, in getting justice in Nigeria under our legal system. Number one, the anarchist person or the defendant may exploit, you know, the technicality of the law. He may engage the services of uh, lawyers that will tend to, you know, find one technicality or other to delay the case. And that is why, you know, our National Assembly, though, they are trying, they are trying in the sense that uh, if you look at the, uh, the, uh, uh, enactment of a uh, uh, administration of a criminal justice mm. act that was signed to law in 2015. Uh, you will discover that uh, a lot of provision have been made to take care of these uh, anomalies. A situation where a defendant, purposely because he wants to delay a case with five refusals uh, objection in court, challenging jurisdiction, and uh, you know uh, all these uh, petty uh, objection. This. Uh, part of the reason why most of these cases, you know, get delayed before justice, uh, you know, uh, is served. Be that as it may, I think uh, what should be the paramount uh, concern here is that at the end of the day, justice has been served. The nation received justice, and the defendant also received justice. But let me tell you, let me send a, 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 let me make a, a, a warning that uh, this is not the end of this case. Certainly, there is possibility of uh, this uh, judgment being appealed against. So we have to wait and see. What other two appellate courts, the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court, uh, are going to say concerning this judgment? Uh, Be that uh, as it may, I think uh, to me. Absolutely. Yes. And, and let me just, let me just, let me just point this out. We have to give out. it to the judiciary. I, I understand your point. Th there's no doubt that uh, we are likely going to see an appeal in this case, and so the case, uh, that it might end up at the Supreme Court. But let's just make it clear that this case actually took eight years and four judges uh, to conclude at the high court level. So 
we'll wait and see how uh, what plays out now at, at uh, the appeal court if he chooses to appeal and of course uh, the, the Supreme Court but let me ask you this final question don't you think it's uh, actually time uh, we, we set up uh, special courts now to try corruption cases I mean this is something that um, some lawyers like uh, you know some lawyers like you have actually talked about it in the past some people have suggested it but but somehow we've, we've not been able to to establish such courts Yes, I think I agree with you absolutely. There is need to have special courts that will be uh, specifically a shadow with the responsibility of handling corruption cases. Uh, if you look at our regular courts, you discover that uh, they have a lot of other pending civil and uh, criminal matters before them. And, you know, corruption is one of the topmost uh, priority when it comes to uh, administration of uh, justice in Nigeria. So it is uh, highly desirable that uh, the nation look into this uh, uh, requests that uh, a special court be established to deal with these uh, uh, cases so that uh, you know the cases will not be you know they, they won't suffer you know uh, such thing we are witnessing under this uh, uh, matter delaying justice and uh, you know what have you the courts will be imbued with the power to deal mainly with those uh, uh, corruption cases and nothing more and we discover that at the end of the day you know our criminal uh, justice system will be highly, you know, enhanced and improved upon. All right. Mr. Falola, thank you very much for joining us on the program and for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me once again. Thank you so very much. We'll take a short break, and we'll be right back. Stay with us. Opinions are free. Facts are sacred. The truth is universal. How in practical terms? Can we, for instance, de-escalate the tension? President must see himself as the president of the Federal Republic. We know where the enemy is. Three places. Um, the Lake Chad Basin, the border area between Nigeria and Cameroon, and then the Sambisa Forest. On DG360, we give you a complete dose of everything. Opinion, facts, and undiluted truths. I hardly believe what politicians say in this uh, part of the world. The new Nigeria is possible, the future is possible. We delve into the issues, dissect it so that you can understand it, use it to take action. I don't think there's any need for go any governor to look for grant for ranching. Digi360, dissecting the issues.